Today I'm going to show you how I built this absolutely stunning sky shader for my voxel game. Everything you see here is rendered real time using the Bevy game engine and Rust. You can live tweak absolutely everything. The gradient coloring, the stars, the aurora. It not only looks pretty, it is blazingly fast due to some clever optimizations. The aurora uses a upscaling technique that runs 25 times faster without losing almost any quality. The noise isn't calculated manually in the shader, they are baked into a 3D texture which is incredibly fast. It is so optimized you can probably run this on your smart fridge. But the best part, I made it fully open source. Consider it a Christmas gift to the Bevy community to help this ecosystem grow. Want AAA sky shading graphics in an instant? Just import the library, add the plugin and you're done. It's as simple as that. If you're curious how this started from nothing and ended up here, let's rewind. You see, my voxel game was in desperate need of some graphical overhauls. I have a lot of things to improve, but sky shading happened to be at the top of the list. When I started this, I honestly underestimated the impact a good sky shader would have on my game. I mean, just look on the comparison from clearing the screen a solid color to, well, using this. It's a night and day difference. Literally. It, it has a day and night cycle now. Now I didn't plan for all of this feature to exist, all I wanted was a simple gradient sky shader. So I made a new Rust library, I spawned a spherical skybox mesh with the normals facing the camera, I wrote a custom material, I wrote some shader code, which I honestly used AI to help me out a bit, and bam, it works, everything I wanted was complete, a simple gradient sky. But I was only unsatisfied how quick this was to build, so I figured, let's add some more features. Stars. We import some noise functions to the shader. Let's map some Voronoi noise onto the skybox. Gonna use the direction from the camera to the fragment as an input into our Voronoi function. And now we have Voronoi mapped to the sky. Doesn't look like stars yet, does it? Let's instead take this noise value and use the smooth step function to threshold it. This is basically telling the GPU only show the color if the value is super bright. By increasing this threshold value, we get stars. <laughs> Boom! But static stars are boring, I want them to move in the sky. So we create a rotation matrix that we can rotate over time. Bam, that's cool, but we are not done yet. I want stars to sparkle. To make the stars modulate in size, we can modify this threshold value. Having a human drag the slider back and forth doesn't sound like a viable option if we're going to ship this project, so we can wiggle this value by putting a global time variable into a sign function. And now we have blinking stars. But wait a minute, the stars blink at the same time. We can't have that. We need to offset the timing of the blinking. We had some more noise functions and some more maths and BAM! And we're finally done with the stars. This is the core thought process. If you understand just a few math concepts, you can create really cool things. And pretty quickly, starting out from a simple noise function, we end up with something like this. The reason I show you this process is to mentally prepare you for the Aurora shader. Man, it's so beautiful. Let me just watch this for a moment. Okay, this is how it works. At a first glance, this shader looks absolutely nuts. Uh, I can't fit this on the screen. This is absolutely ridiculous. But just like the stores, it actually started out very simple and by continuously adding small features on the way, we somehow ended with this very scary looking code. But just like the stars, I will show you that this Aurora effect is pretty easy to understand if we start with a few simple ideas. We can break this illusion of this beautiful Aurora by zeroing all of my parameters. And as you see, it becomes easier to reason how this effect might have come about. Let's reconstruct this Aurora in a new shader project from scratch. I should probably start out by mentioning that the aurora effect happens completely in the fragment shader. I used the exact same skybox mesh to draw the aurora, and here's the proof of that. No additional meshes are acquired. Can you imagine that? Like procedurally generating spline meshes or something? You could truly overcomplicate things, but luckily we don't need to do that. Let's jump into the code. We're gonna start by adding a height variable. This is the height of the plane we want the aurora to live on. Now we're working with the spherical sky mesh, but we need to figure out where the direction we're looking at intersects with that plane. We can do that by dividing the height by the direction to the vertex. That gives us the distance we need to travel to reach that height. If the height, for example, is 2 and the view direction is 0.5 on the y-axis, well, 2 divided by 0.5 is 4. We will need to travel 4 units in our direction to reach this height. 
Okay, let's do that. Let's take the direction and travel that distance. Now we reach the world position of the plane intersection. To make lines in the sky, we will use the world position and put it into a fractional function. This will create a visual repeating pattern going from 0 to 1. The fractional function returns basically the decimals of a number. 2.5 removes the 2, returns 0 0.5. 3.2 removes the 3 and returns 0 0.2. And this is the result. We have our repeating pattern on the x, going from 0 to 1 every unit. But wait a minute, this pattern appears below the horizon. We can't have that. The reason this happens is because, well, if the direction is negative on the y-axis, if we're pointing below the horizon, using our previous example of the aurora height of 2, taking 2 and dividing by negative 0 0.5, that gives us a distance of negative 4 to reach this plane intersection. When the view direction is negative, aka pointing below the horizon, realistically we don't want to allow it to go backwards to reach the height. So to ignore this case, let's introduce a variable called up factor. By multiplying the color with the up factor, we stop rendering the plane intersection upside down. And we get a bonus! Far away positions becomes faded and close up positions are fully lit. Instead of using the fractal value that goes from 0 to 1 repeatedly, if we take the absolute value of the fractal and subtract it by 0 0.5, we instead get what appears to be smooth lines. To reduce the frequency, I'm going to use my favorite function, smooth step. And this is the result. We're getting closer. We will now add some verticality by calculating this ray intersection multiple times in a loop. And the height value should increase for each iteration. Let's add some wiggles. We'll call a noise function with the world position as an input. We'll add a time offset. And there we go. Now the lines are starting to dance. Now it's just a matter of fact of adding some small things here and there. And I will not dive into the technical details any further. But here are some of the most important features in the completed version. We can change color depending on the height. To make auroras look more soft, I modify the alpha value based on the height. I also try to mimic how real auroras work. In some video footage, you see these undersparkles. I don't know what it's called, but that's what I'm gonna call it. Look at these beautiful undersparkles. But basically, the bottom of the aurora sometimes sparkle a pinkish green or white color. And to do that, I sample another noise function, and I only show it in the lower parts of the aurora. That's the whole aurora shader in a nutshell. It's open source, so you can go check it out yourself. Now, let's talk optimizations. Suppose you rendered the game in 1920 by 1028 resolution. If we sample the aurora, Aurora playing 60 times, we run all of these calculations 124,416,000 times to render a single frame. Now we do want a high sample count because if we use a low value like 1, well the aurora looks very flat. So let's not reduce the sampling count too much. We could however reduce the texture size. If we make the aurora render texture 5 times smaller and sampling 60 times, we only need to run these functions about 5 million times per frame. That's a reduction by about 27 times. Now of course that means we are upscaling this lower quality texture onto the entire screen, which will reduce the quality of the aurora effect but I found that using an Aurora texture, 20% of the original screen size almost looks identical. So we actually get 25 times the performance for free! Of course we could go even lower than that, which looks bad, but it would enable you to run this on any device in the world. But wait, we can go even faster! The slow part about this loop are the noise functions. That's a whole lot of math each iteration. We can remove all of this math and replace it with a single texture fetch by baking the noise data into textures. How much faster is that really? Well, about three times faster. I actually benchmarked the shader this time using RenderDoc. Really cool software. So this is the baseline. Rendering the Aurora with these slow noise functions, it took 1231 microseconds. Okay, Editor Tanton here. So it used to say that, but every time I open this capture, it changes the timing. The values are generally in the re same range though. So if anyone knows anything about that, let me know. That's actually decent, but let's see how much faster we can get this. Now using the texture sampling and baking the noise instead, we get 425 microseconds to draw a single aurora frame. We made it three times faster just changing how we calculate noise. That's really fast actually. Did you hear that right? Microseconds. This is really fast. Okay, but how slow is the original version if we do no upscaling and no noise baking? But uh, well, 15,206 microseconds. 
Using only two optimizations, we made this shader 43 times faster without reducing the visual quality, I might add. Optimization is addictive. It's so fun seeing these numbers go down. So my first commit on this project was about a month ago, so it's been a fairly long project. If I didn't decide to make this open source, I would probably be done a few weeks ago, but I decided to make it open source for multiple reasons. Mainly forcing myself to make the library have a clean API design, and to ensure everything is really robust. Designing a clean API that is also customizable takes time, and I'm really happy with how it works right now. You can just add the plugin as it is, or you can customize specific parts using the builder pattern. Let's talk about robustness. Now, in theorizing how others could use this library, including myself in the future, I kept realizing some small but very important details. For example, baking noise data to textures is not free. We have to calculate the noise for however large you want the noise texture to be. Which, by the way, I need a setting for that. I made settings for everything. Because generating the noise textures is so slow, especially for textures bigger than 128 cubed, Simply instantiating my plugin could freeze the execution for a few frames, noticeably enough for it to be in concern. So I implemented a noise texture caching functionality that will save the noise textures to files, making the load times almost instant. But shipping this as a default might be a bad idea, so I need an option to enable or disable that. Now what about serialization? Maybe you want to enable gamers to change the quality of the sky, then maybe that needs to be saved to a file. It's a good idea to make serialization to be an optional compilation feature, so I did that. Now I am very happy I didn't build this library inside my voxel game, because not only do I have a really clean API now, it's built very robustly and when I work on the voxel game, there is simply less files to care about, so that's nice. And because it's open source, other people can contribute and make this even better. I've always seen myself as someone who doesn't like graphics programming, but I think I'm allowed to update that title now. I'm a freaking pro! Oh, not really. You could probably find a hundred things to improve upon, so please do that. Hehe. <laughs>